si la France n'était pas intervenue, si nos militaires n'étaient pas tombés au champ d'honneur en Afrique, si Serval puis Barkhane n'avaient pas été décidés, nous ne parlerions pas aujourd'hui ni de Mali, ni de Burkina Faso, ni de Niger. Ces États n'existeraient plus aujourd'hui dans leurs limites territoriales. Je peux vous le dire avec certitude. This is my video update from Athens, Greece on this Sunday morning, September the 3rd. Let's talk about some news and let's start things off with protests in Niger. There was a, a big protest in Niger the other day. Thousands of people outside of a French military base and they want the French troops gone. They want France out of Niger. Even The Guardian, even The Guardian reported on this. Thousands rally in Niger seeking withdrawal of French troops. Thousands of protesters rallied in Niger's capital, Niamey, to call for the withdrawal of French troops as demanded by a junta that seized power in June. The demonstrators gathered near a base housing French soldiers on Saturday after a call by several civic organizations hostile to the French military presence in the West African country. They held up banners proclaiming, French army, leave our country. What is the French army doing in their country? What are you doing there? Why are you there? The people of Niger, they want the French army to go. There is more pressure on uh, ECOWAS, mounting pressure on ECOWAS to intervene. And there are reports that ECOWAS is indeed getting ready to, to intervene in Niger. The reports claim that uh, the ECOWAS forces are ready to enter the country in what they said is going to be a one-time operation. Go in, restore the, uh, the government that was ousted, and then leave. Those are the latest reports that we have uh, regarding the ECOWAS intervention. We'll see if ECOWAS does indeed intervene or invade uh, Niger. No doubt that Macron is, is getting a lot of pressure, is very nervous as, uh, as he sees France's position in Africa deteriorate fall apart. That is what is happening with France in Africa. And this is also making the U.S. Uh, very nervous because as France's position in Africa deteriorates, many neocons believe that that will lead to the U.S.'s position in Africa deteriorating. And of course, the neocons are worried about China and Russia stepping in. There was an article on, uh, on the gray zone a couple of days ago and they actually traveled to South Africa and they interviewed South African officials who uh, held talks with Victoria Newland when she visited South Africa. I believe she was there on July, July 29th, I believe. And, uh, and this was at the same time that the Niger coup was, was unfolding. And according to the Grey Zone's reporting, Newland was just in complete panic. This is what South African officials told the Grey Zone, that Newland was just, just losing her mind at, uh, at what was unfolding in Niger. And she had no idea how to, how to deal with it. And uh, she actually asked South Africa. She actually asked South Africa for, uh, for some help. And uh, she said that, that the U.S. has a thousand troops in Niger and, uh, and if South Africa would help to straighten out the situation in Niger, in Niger to restore the, the government that was, that was ousted, then she would uh, give South Africa money and loans and stuff like that. But according to the Grey Zone's reporting, Newland was, uh, was completely clueless about the, the coup and and she had uh, no idea what to do with the situation in Niger. So that is the latest from Niger. I think there's going to be a concert here. There's definitely going to be a concert here at the, 
Panathinaikos Stadium here in Athens. So from Niger, I want to talk about an interesting story which came out yesterday from uh, an interview with the former two-time Italian Prime Minister Giuliano Amato. And in this interview, he claimed that the Ustica massacre, a plane crash in 1980, which killed, I believe, uh, 81 passengers on board. It was a flight from Bologna to Sicily, flight 870 from Bologna to Sicily on June 27th, 1980, that this plane was actually shot down, according to the ex-Prime uh, Minister of Italy, Amato. The plane was shot down by the French and the United States. And why did they shoot down this plane? Which up until today, no one knows why this plane uh, uh, crashed. Uh, they still haven't uh, found out what was the cause for this plane crash. But according to the, the Italian ex prime minister, France and the US shot this plane down because they believed that Gaddafi was on this plane. Get that. Now this is, of course, we don't have any, any evidence. The, uh, the Italian Prime Minister did not provide any, any evidence connected to this, this statement, this theory. But uh, from what I understand, at the time in 1980, the Libyan leader was flying this route or was about to fly this route. I think he was attending a meeting in Yugoslavia. Here we go. Gaddafi was allegedly supposed to return from a meeting in Yugoslavia aboard a military plane through the same airspace. But according to Amato, Italy had warned him and the Libyan leader changed his plans. NATO officials denied any military activity in the area on the night of the tragedy. Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney said that the ex-Prime Minister's claims deserve attention, but urged him to share evidence if he has any. What a statement. What a claim from the uh, former Italian Prime Minister, huh? Well, who knows? If this is true, if it isn't true, but remember my videos where I, uh, I talked about how it would be best if Putin did not travel to, to the BRICS meeting in South Africa, not so much because of the ICC warrant, but because the way I saw it, the neocons are, are in such a state of panic because of the collapse of Project Ukraine and everything else that's going on in the world. For example, it's happening in Africa at the moment. There's, uh, they're in such a state of panic that who knows what they would do. And, and my, uh, my thinking at the time of, uh, of the BRICS summit, before the BRICS summit, and everyone was discussing whether Putin would travel to South Africa, my thinking at the time was, you know, it's probably best for Putin not to be on a plane that is uh, outside of of Russian airspace or friendly or friendly Russian airspace, countries that are friendly to Russia, their airspace, because who knows what, uh, what the neocons would do. I think this story kind of, kind of is, is connected to that. And, uh, and it's incredible if, if this is true, but I, I wouldn't doubt it. I would not doubt it. We, we know what eventually happened to Gaddafi, don't we? So who knows, maybe back in 1980, the, the French and, and the Americans, they were, they were trying to figure out a way to take out Gaddafi way back in 1980. Eventually, it took Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton to, to finish the, the task of, of killing Gaddafi, but taking down a plane. 
in Italy. Possible that they thought Gaddafi was traveling on. Wasn't, uh, didn't the same thing happen with, with Eva Morales? They didn't want to take down the plane, but they thought that Assange was on that plane and they wanted to, to ground that plane. So, you know, my thinking at the time with Putin traveling to South Africa, I think was, was, was pretty spot on. He, he should not take long, long distance trips or travel in airspace that, that could be seen as, I don't want to say hostile, but is not under the, the protection of, of Russia or countries friendly to, to Russia. Anyway, that was, uh, that was an interesting story. Thought I would share that with everybody. And let's now, uh, let's now talk about Putin and Erdogan because they are going to be meeting in, in a few days, I believe next week. And this is the first meeting to take place since Erdogan stabbed Putin in the back with the release of the Azov guys a few months ago, where he broke the agreement of the Azov fighters in Mariupol that were supposed to remain in Turkey until the conclusion of the special military operation. But Erdogan, he, he released those Azov guys and he broke the agreement with Russia and uh, Putin and Erdogan they have not met since but they are going to be meeting in the next uh, couple of days and Erdogan wanted Putin to travel to Ankara to meet in Turkey and Putin said nope no chance and so they are going to be meeting but they're going to be meeting on Putin's home turf in Sochi and for Erdogan, the topic that he wants to, to discuss is the grain deal. And he wants to try and get Russia back into the grain deal. And uh, Lavrov, the foreign minister, met with uh, the Turkish foreign minister last week. And they discussed the, the terms of the grain deal and what it would take for Russia to re-enter the grain deal. And uh, according to Lavrov, and according to all of the reports about the upcoming meeting between Putin and Erdogan, it's really simple. For Russia to re-enter the grain deal, three conditions have to be met. The first condition is that the ships that go in and out of the, the ports in, uh, in Ukraine, the port in Odessa, they have to be inspected. And probably Russia's going to ask that they're allowed to inspect these ships, but whatever is going in and out of that port can't carry weapons and that corridor cannot be used to launch attacks towards Crimea. So that's going to be the, the first condition, which I imagine Ukraine is not going to, to like and they're not going to, to go for that one. But the other two conditions are the two conditions that the European Union could have easily done over the last nine months, but they refused to follow the agreement and they didn't do these two conditions. And the first condition, let's go back around. And the first condition is that they have to open the SWIFT access for the agricultural bank. So uh, this is something that probably takes 10 seconds for the European Union to do. This was part of the, the grain agreement for, for nine, 10 months, the EU refused to open up the SWIFT for the agricultural bank, probably because the US ordered the European Union not to do it. And, uh, and Russia exited the grain deal because they waited and they waited. Every three months, the grain deal was renewed and Russia uh, re-entered the grain deal, but after nine months, they said, you know, all the EU has to do is press a button and open up the SWIFT to this one bank and an agricultural bank at that. And they refused to do it. And so Russia, Russia left the deal. This was very easy for the European Union to do. And in a video that I did with Alexander on the Duran channel, Alexander brings up the point that every time the Collective West talks about the grain deal, and Blinken gives an interview about the grain deal. And 
he talks about how Russia is starving the world and Russia uh, exited the grain deal and now many people are going to go hungry. And Jungle Joseph Burrell talks about how Russia is starving the world and Putin is evil. You know, they come out with all these statements, but they never mention the collective West media. They never, ever, ever mention how one of the one of the big things that the European Union had to do part of this agreement that the European Union had to execute, which was the simplest thing for them to do, which was to open up swift access to the agricultural bank, they failed to do. For nine months, they failed to do it. And the collective West media never mentions that fact. And, uh, you know, Russia's not going to, to re-enter the grain deal unless SWIFT is opened for the agricultural bank. And uh, they're not going to, to enter the grain deal under the conditions that the European Union will open it. You have our word. Next week they'll open it or next month they'll open it. Uh-uh. Putin and, uh, and Lavrov, what they're going to demand is for the European Union to open up swift access now for the agricultural bank. Otherwise, see you later. That's what they're going to tell Erdogan. And they're going to tell Erdogan to go to to Ursula to call up Ursula and tell her you better open up the swift access. Otherwise, we're not even going to uh, to think about, to talk about Russia re-entering the grain deal. And the other condition that has to be met, the third condition is that, and this was part of the agreement, is that the funds of uh, the fertilizer uh, producers, the agriculture, uh, the agriculture producers in Russia, whatever funds are uh, frozen, they have to be unfrozen. So that's another condition that, once again, the Collective West refused to, to do. It was part of the deal. They did not abide by the terms of, uh, of the deal, and they didn't unfreeze the funds of those producers. And Russia is going to demand that those funds are unfrozen. So the Collective West has a bunch of, of things that they're going to need to do. In order. I'm listening to you. Oh, hey. <laughs> Great. You are, huh? I'll message you later. All right. Cool. Take care, man. Um, yeah, so they're going to they're gonna have to have to agree to to these terms. Otherwise, Russia's not going to not even going to entertain the fact of uh, of entering the grain deal again. It's not going to happen. So we'll see. Next week is going to be an interesting week. Erdogan and Putin. They have a very interesting relationship. A very interesting relationship. So, uh, what else should we talk about? More articles are uh, coming out. Claiming that the... Uh, the Ukraine military has broken through the, the first lines of, uh, of Russian defenses in, in the Rabatone Zaporozhye. Hey, buddy. In the uh, Zaporozhye Rabatone region. Cute dog. And um, yeah, <laughs> you know, the reports that I'm getting are they're still fighting in Rap Rapotine. So, well, what, what a strange situation. What a strange situation indeed. Every day we're getting more and more articles from the Collective West that Ukraine is advancing and they're approaching the second line of defense. Kirby says they've already reached the second line of defense. Meanwhile, the Russian Ministry of Defense is saying that fighting continues in the Rabatoni area. And uh, a lot of the fighting is now taking place in, uh, on the flanks in an area known as uh, Verbove. And the Ukraine military is looking to, to go around Rabotina because they can't break through straight on. So we'll find out. We'll find out in a week or two what the truth really is. Has Ukraine made it to the first line of defenses? Are they approaching the second line of defense, or is, uh, is this just, just more Collective West propaganda? And you'll know what the truth is, because either 
in a week or two's time, either the collective West is going to be uh, talking up the great victory that is the capture or the liberation of this small town, the small village of what was once 480, 500 people. So they're going to be talking it up a whole lot. And when Alensky goes to the United States, he's going to, to be meeting with the Biden White House and there'll be speeches and awards and money, a lot of money. And there's going to be a vote in Congress and they're going to give more money to Ukraine, not to Hawaii. They're not going to give any money to Hawaii. Congress, the U.S. government, the Biden White House, they don't really care that much about Hawaii. But if, uh, if Rabotinia is indeed liberated, captured, uh, call it whatever you will, by the Ukraine military, then there's going to be a whole lot of coverage. I mean a whole lot of coverage. But if it's not in two, three weeks when Alensky is uh, in New York for the U.N. meeting and uh, the Collective West media just stops talking about it, like... It just disappears from the headlines then you know that everything they've been saying was was a lie so that's how we'll know the collective west media is not going to admit that ukraine failed in its attempts to capture rapotina that's for sure they're just gonna stop reporting on the story so the new york times they uh they put out an article and they talked a bit about how Ukraine has managed to make these advances. Why all of a sudden is Ukraine able to advance, according to the New York Times, to the uh, first line of Russian defenses? And the New York Times says that Ukraine has done this by, uh, by not using vehicles and tanks. And they're advancing on foot. And that is how the Ukraine military avoids the minefields and that's how they've captured according to the new york times these hamlets in zaporozhye but the problem according to the new york times in this article is that russia has now adapted to how uh, ukraine is is advancing in this area and they're starting to to annihilate these Rus these uh, Ukraine soldiers who are moving on foot. They're moving on foot. That is how they are capturing, according to the New York Times, Rapatinya and Urojanya and these villages. They're walking. <laughs> They're walking. There are no vehicles. There's no Bradleys. There's no Leopards, Challenger tanks, none of that. They're going on foot. And so the Russians, according to the New York Times, they're saying, okay, well, if you're going to go on foot, we'll, uh, we'll adapt our tactics. And this is what the New York Times says in their article. And, uh, and they talk about how Russia is now annihilating these Ukraine soldiers on foot. They will lace a pasture filled with mines with a flammable agent, for instance. Once the Ukrainians get to work clearing an opening... The Russians will drop a grenade from a drone igniting a sea of fire and explosions. Paved roads are safer for the Ukrainians as mines are easier to spot and remove. However, these roads are dotted with Russian machine gun nests and under constant drone surveillance. Should a Ukrainian unit succeed in capturing a house or a building, hovering drones alert Russian forces who respond by launching salvos of, ro of rockets and shells on the location. From the moment they are spotted, one Ukrainian soldier told the New York Times that his men have seconds to dive for cover. Is this how, uh, is this how Ukraine, how the Ukraine military is going to make it to the Sea of Azov? Is this how they're going to hold on to Turabotine or Urojanya? by having their soldiers move on foot and the Russians have already uh, adopted, adapted to, uh, to this technique. They, they, they go on foot and, and then the Russians drop a, a grenade and the, the terrain lights up. The ground is on fire. And then when they get to, to a house, according to the New York Times, when they get to, 
to a home, to a building, then Russian drones alert the Russian military, and that's when the, when the rockets and, and the shelling begins. This is why you have such huge casualties on the, uh, on the Ukrainian military side. If, if this isn't human wave tactics, then someone tell me what, what, what is the definition of human wave tactics then, if this isn't it. It's horrible. It's horrible what, uh, what the Alensky regime is, uh, is asking the Ukraine military to do. It's absolutely horrible. And of course the Russians are going to uh, adapt to this. I mean... And, and the, uh, the article mentions that Rabotinye is 100 kilometers from the Sea of Azov. So this is, this is the tactic that they've used on foot. On foot is the tactic that they have used to, uh, to get a foothold in Rabotinia. And they have another 100 plus kilometers to go to get to the Sea of Azov, which was the, the stated goal in all of this, right? Split the Russian forces. Really, is this how it's going to, to happen on foot? That's how they're going to do this? Incredible stuff, man. Incredible stuff. Horrible stuff, actually. Horrible, if you want my opinion. So uh, there's a couple of quick stories that I want to get to. And we'll do a, a clown world. And one of those stories has to do with the Biden White House deciding to, uh, to send depleted uranium with the Abrams tanks. That's quite quite an escalation from the Biden White House. So the, the Challenger tanks, they have depleted uranium. And now the Abrams, the Abrams tanks will have depleted uranium. And those Abrams tanks are in Germany. And they're, from what uh, the latest reports are, those tanks are ready to, to go to Ukraine, the first 10 of those tanks. And you're going to have a total of 31 of those tanks. Russia's going to to destroy these tanks, these Abrams tanks are going to burn very, very, uh, very nicely for the Russian military, and uh, they're also going to capture some of these tanks and um, send them to the to the military museum in Moscow. But uh, the the Biden White House, they, I'm, I'm, I imagine they understand this, but obviously they don't care, and their goal is to is to destroy the uh, the land. The territory of uh, of Zaporozhye and, and Kherson, Donetsk, Lugansk. That's that's their goal. Chaos, chaos, destruction for uh, poison, poison toxicity, as the system of a down song says. Toxicity for many many years to come, for many decades to come. That's that's the Biden White House for you. <laughs> I was a, I was a bee or a wasp. <laughs> Just, I think it hit my sunglasses. But um, yeah, and then we have uh, Putin's response and the Russian government's response, which see, that guy's not looking too good. And uh, and their response to all of this Biden White House escalation with depleted uranium. And by the way, the Biden White House has also sent cluster munitions as well. So obviously the Biden White House is in panic mode and they're in chaos mode and they're in, in destruction mode. If we can't have it, then we're going to break it and no one can have it. That's basically the thinking now of the neocons. Let's inflict as much damage and suffering as possible for many, many decades to come because... We've lost this thing, and we're a bunch of sore loser crybabies. But uh, the, uh, the, the Kremlin, their, uh, their chess move to all of this was the, the announcement that the Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile is ready to go. And from what I understand, this missile can travel up to 
I believe 18,000 kilometers. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's 18,000 kilometers, which means it can pretty much hit anywhere on the planet and it's ready to go. I mean, it's, it's like ready to, to spring into action. Obviously, this is Putin telling the uh, collective West and the United States that uh, if they do decide to, to go to war with Russia, well, then the, the, uh, the Americans, obviously, the boots on the ground will obviously enter uh, Ukraine and try to enter Russian territory. But this time around, uh, the war is going to come to the United States as well. And it's going to come to Europe. And it's going to come to London, even the express.co.uk. They uh, put out an article and they said, Putin's, Putin puts hypersonic nuke capable of wiping out London in six minutes on combat duty. Vladimir Putin's terrifying Sarmat strategic missile system, also known as the Satan II, is ready for combat duty, duty according to the head of Moscow's space agency. So the express.co.uk, they're, they're complaining, right? That how, how could Putin do this? What, a, what an evil man. What a dictator. The Russians, they're so evil. They've got this, this missile ready to go, on duty, ready to, to launch. And it can wipe out London in six minutes. Well, you know, I don't know. Maybe the, the elite class in London, the warmonger neo, neocons in London, should have, should have thought of that before they decided to to escalate with Russia before they decided to send depleted uranium on those Challenger tanks to uh, the Alensky regime. Maybe they should have thought of, uh, of this, the fact that Russia has the best weapons and the best missiles around. But they didn't really think about that, did they? They were under the belief that, that Russia was removing chips from washing machines in order to power up their fighter jets, right? The Russian economy is in tatters. Tatters, I tell you. <laughs> oh boy. So let's do a clown world and we'll wrap this video up. I think I'm making a, a bit of a shorter video today. Hopefully it's a shorter video today. I've been putting out 40 minute, 40 minute videos lately. So uh, I think I'm all right on time. How about this story that Ukraine goes on the attack against Mars and PepsiCo? American food and beverage multinationals PepsiCo and Mars have been declared international war sponsors by the Ukrainian National Corruption Prevention Agency, the NCPA, due to their reluctance to leave the Russian market, according to an announcement by the agency on Friday. By the way, the NCPA is is pretty much an American uh, agency and it really has nothing to do with corruption. But anyway, the NCPA, which manages the list, had previously, had previously declared one of the world's biggest snack companies, Mandelez International, an enemy of Ukraine for the same reason. Despite all the statements about reduction of their businesses, halting advertise, advertising and manufacturing in Russia, they, PepsiCo and Mars, keep working in Russia, paying significant taxes to the state budget, the NCPA said in a statement. The agency also said that the U.S. corporate giants are actively looking for new employees in Russia. So they're upset that Mars and Pepsi are still active in Russia. You know, the, the foreign minister of, uh, of Austria, he came out with a statement a couple of days ago, and he said that maybe 10% at most of all the companies, all the collective West companies in Russia have actually left. <laughs> 10%, that's it. And the rest of the companies are operating, you know, in Russia under various uh, schemes and uh, various structures and schemes and, and stuff like that. And uh, he's probably right. I don't know if it's 10%, maybe it's more than that, but you know, the, you, you saw the videos when I was in Moscow or St. Petersburg. You saw the videos when I was in the shopping malls. You know, everything is, is normal. All the, all the shelves are, are uh, stocked with, 
with whatever you want. And all the brands are there. Maybe they have different names. Maybe it's not Starbucks, but it's Stars. And uh, maybe it's not McDonald's, but it's it's uh, uh, Tochna Fkusna. I think that's that's what it's called. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, they're they're all there. Burger King, Burger King is there. KFC is kind of there under a different name, but uh, you know, Pepsi, Coke, Dobri Cola, Rich Cola. Anyway, you, Ukraine is upset about this. They want Mars and they want Pepsi, PepsiCo to, to leave, to get out of Russia because they continue to pay taxes and they continue to actively look for new employees. That is what the NCPA, this corruption agency in Ukraine said. These U.S. companies, these U.S. corporate giants are actively looking for new employees in Russia. Well, newsflash, when the economy is booming, you look for employees. <laughs> that's, that's what you have to do. And the Russian economy right now is booming. Wasn't there a Financial Times article that came out the other day which said that the European Union has purchased 40% more uh, LNG gas or natural gas from Russia than, than in 2021? Like there was a small uptick from 2022 to 2023. But if you compare the gas that was purchased by the EU in 2023 with the gas that was purchased in 2021, and I think it's LNG gas, then it, it's like a 39.5% increase. <laughs> Business is booming in Russia. I mean, what can you say? That's just the reality. You can't, uh, you can't cancel Russia. And the Austrian foreign minister, Schellenberg, said the same thing in the, in the interview that I was just talking about. He said, it's, this is ridiculous to, to believe that you're going to be able to, to cancel Russia. It's, it's fantasy, he said. And he's right. You know, Austria is taking, a, with each passing day, it's obvious that Austria is trying to, to get out of this mess. This, this proxy war, sanctions against Russia mess. They are, Austria is gravitating. Slowly, slowly, it seems like they're gravitating closer to uh, Hungary's position. That's the sense that I'm getting. I mean, that's, those are the statements coming out of Austrian officials. So that's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter. And go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code Good Day. Oh, by the way, I made a small little error on my video yesterday when I talked about Kolomoisky's servant, servant of the people program, when I talked about Igor Kolomoisky and Alensky, I said that Alensky, the, the, the part that he was giving in, given in this TV sitcom called Servant of the People, that he played an actor who ended up becoming president of Ukraine. The, uh, the sitcom, the show was actually a school teacher who became president of Ukraine. So Oletsky played a school teacher who then ended up becoming the president of, uh, of Ukraine. Pretty, <laughs> pretty incredible story, isn't it? A sitcom used as, uh, as a method to, to create a political party which would then win the elections and usher in the the age of, of Alensky, the presidency of Alensky, and the eventual arrest of the man who, who thought it all up, oligarch Igor Kolomoisky. So that's just a small correction from my video yesterday. All right, everybody, I'm, I'm signing off. Refugees, welcome. <laughs> Refugees, welcome. Tourists, go home. Come on. That, the graffiti artist doesn't mean that. We, we, we love tourists in Greece. <laughs> tourists, we want you to come here. <laughs> All right, everybody, take care.